Yes, it's time we begin and uh, uh, request Friends Day with uh, a few more minutes of activity to also join us. But since most of us are ready with that, let's get going. The tabletop simulation of a uh, mass casualty. Mr. Dov Meisel, who helped us understand technical medicine, will undertake this session. And uh, yeah, without any more introduction, over to Mr. Meisel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, again. Um, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Higher up? Is it better? Okay. Uh, I'm aware we are after lunch, and therefore we need to think differently. Oxygen is difficult to go up to the brain now, as it is focusing on more important places. So what we'll do now, this tabletop exercise, will be interactive, uh, meaning we'll be running through a scenario of a casualty incident, and all of you will be participating in this uh, exercise. What I'll be expecting is, a, is cooperation. Um, this is the stage, this is the opportunity to share with, with me and with uh, Eric, which you've met uh, uh, in uh, yesterday's presentations. You'll be assisting me in this tabletop, and I guess we'll, uh, we'll just take off and start doing it. So, Basically, the objective is to discuss and facilitate a sort of a hands-on feeling of what we're doing in times of a mass casualty incident, what is the role that each of us plays, whether it's the medical field or security, law enforcement, media, everything that you were addressed with yesterday in the topic of incident command. Um, we'll discuss different roles. The idea is I'll be presenting the incident as it rolls and unfolds and you'll be providing the insight on how you and how you think would be the best response and what the actions are to do. So we'll be uh, making the microphones run around here a little bit, but uh, I think it'll be more interesting than just falling asleep in front of a presentation for lunch. So, so let's go. Um, the direct purpose is to give you an opportunity to evaluate current response concept, plans, and capabilities for response to explosives related events. This is obviously a totally invented incident. It has nothing to do with any reality of any place that would be mentioned here. Um, it's all for the tabletop sandbox war games purpose. We're expecting you to basically provide your input on what you in the situation in the different categories. We have no hidden agendas here. This is totally open to everyone. Um, you are all you are players in the game. You'll be receiving information all at the same time on the screen. Um, I have no answers for anything in this game. You ladies and gentlemen are providing the answers for. We can try with the help of which discussed incident command yesterday and COOP, very important uh, topics. Um, take that information and try to put it to good use um, here. Like I said, there's no predetermined solutions. At the end of this presentation, there won't be a slide saying we did A, B, C, D, or E correct or incorrect. And by the way, there is no incorrect answer to anything that we would be presented here because this is a, a, could be a life situation. We need to deal with it. So, it starts out with some background information. The time is 12.30, the weather is sunny, and mild 83 degrees Fahrenheit, winds are calm, and it's a humid day. Over the past week, there have been a rash of suspicious package calls throughout the community, all of which have proven to be without merit. We've got to think strategically, assessment strategically. First of all, does any of this information that we got mean to us. What does it mean? It means the weather is nice, right? That's important. It's a, it's a, good, it, it's a good start. Pardon? Possibly. There have been all kinds of calls. Things are coming along, right? Do we as a community do anything at this point to prepare ourselves? We'd maybe make sure we have a coop 
program put together or make sure our organization are, you know, taking out the protocols, shaking off the dust, and everything's up to date, something like that. Asking people to be more alert, that's a very good thing. Be alert for what? Be alert for suspicious packages. But we see people calling in. It means people are already alert, which is good. Reinforce that feeling. Correct. Just people looking. But we don't want, on the other hand, to scare the public. We just want to make sure, you know, guys, everything is okay, but keep your eyes open. Maintain, uh, you've got eyes, use them. Don't be oblivious to where you're living. So the community health care assessed have also reported an increase in reports of suspicious devices and phone threats, such as this one that we'll be looking to right now. This is the call center of the medical center, the hospital. Main Medical Center, Kevin speaking. How can I help you? Hello, Main Medical Center, Kevin speaking. Yo, you are horrible. I don't like you guys. Mother's a good person. My mother's a good person. You guys treat her horrible. I'm sorry. If, um, is there someone I can get you through to to possibly help with? Yeah, I'm here. I'm drinking really good beer today. You know that? Well, Do you like no. beer? Personally, no, but, you know, I can understand why some people do. Uh, you know, my mother, she's a good, you know, one day, you guys are all going down in a blaze. Well, uh, I, I, I don't know that that would necessarily help anything. Is there someone I can get you through to to possibly help with your problem? It's going to be a big blaze, too. Fire, smoke, and I'm going to stand here on the corner, watch it all. So, but I'm going to get my mom out of there first. So you intend to possibly burn person, the person, you guys? I believe you. You guys aren't You don't care really anything about her. What's her name? Maybe I can get some help from her. She needs you guys. She is sick. She is? Where is she being seen? You want to have a beer with me? Well, it, well I'm at work right now, but afterwards? I'm going to get another beer. I'm going to get another beer. Okay, did we understand what was said? No, I'll, I'll go over briefly what, the, what was said there because the question wasn't really super. The room is very big. There's this lady on the phone in the medical center saying, complaining that the medical center are bad people and that uh, they're treating her mother terribly. Her mother is admitted in the hospital there. They're treating her terribly. In the middle, she starts talking about that she wants beer drink. Obviously this is not 100% normal person. And then she goes on threatening that all go down in flames and smoke. I'm going to stand outside and watch it all happen. Obviously I'm going to take my mother out of there first and then I'll watch you all go down in flames. And then she goes into wanting the beer again. So, when you get a call like this, is there any significance to a call like this? Obviously, there's significance. The question is, what do we do with this call? This call center, the medical center, the hospital uh, call center gets this call. What, what, what do we expect them to do at this point? What do we expect them? What's the next? The guy gets off the phone and says, oh my God, this crazy woman just called me, threatened to blow up the hospital. She sounds crazy. So he's got two options. What's he going to do? Two options. Guys, you're falling asleep. He was that good? Well, they can either report it, or they cannot report it. If they don't report it, obviously nothing will happen. But remember, we're talking about there are incoming calls, threats, different things. Things are, something is happening under the ground. We don't know exactly what. And when a call like this comes in, obviously we'd expect them to report it. Report it, obviously, you want to go to the at least security officer of the medical center. If there's a security officer, if there isn't, you call the police, law enforcement, at least notify them on the radar that something is happening. We got this call. It's a direct threat. You're all going to go down in flames. It sounds, it sounds quite uh, conspicuous. So this is a, a photo of the medical center. And a short time after that, dispatch of emergency services receives a call. 
There's reports of an explosion with fire on the third level of the mall parking garage. At this point, there is no reports of injuries. But this, I'll remind you, is the initial call. You usually have calls coming into the emergency center, frantic calls, people screaming, there's been an explosion, not really giving much information. Additional information that we have is we're starting to receive multiple reports uh, from the area reporting multiple car fires in the garage. So what do we know happened? What do we know that happened? There was an explosion in the parking lot. There's a fire. And this might even register a threat call. It might be related. It might not, by the way. It could be two different things. But at this point, we have a situation. The dispatch center, the emergency service dispatch center is receiving calls for an explosion and needs to activate their protocol for man casualty incident. And they need to kick in incident command. This is time. What happens is in emergency services, they have their regular day operations. They receive calls, send an ambulance, they receive calls, send a police car, whatever it is. But when something like this happens, then they divide the work down there in the center. There's the ones who work with the regular calls. Obviously, even though there's a bomb that went off in this hospital parking lot or in the mall parking lot, still with a chest pain is going to be calling in for the ambulance, obviously. So we got to take consideration, put that on the side. But they pull out the protocol. The protocol basically is the activation of ICS, incident command system. Yes, just a mall second. The, is the mall near the hospital? Is that what was said? Yes, just a second. I see that the picture is overtaking the text. Just a second. Let me get that technical slide out. There we go, that one. Minimize the picture, or just even delete it. There we go. We're back to the presentation. You see, I can be Mr. ITO. There. Okay. So, incident overview um, is the mall, which is next to the hospital. It's a typical Western mall, full of all international-owned retailers, brand names, etc. Um, serves a major media production facility and major museum. This is a big from the picture that we saw. So what does the dispatch center need to take into consideration? You look at this complex, big complex. What do they need to start thinking when they activate? Besides activating ICS, the incident command system, what do they need to start thinking is happening there? What are their first actions? When they receive this call. What do they do? Just shout it out. I need the speaker. Fight the fire. Fight the fire. What else? Evacuation. Kill people. What would we imagine? Is this, when, we're, when we have an explosion in a parking lot of a big shopping mall, in a media center, in a museum, would we expect this to be with few victims? Or would we expect this to be many, many victims? Meaning, we need to activate our system and start sending out forces. What forces do we need to send in an incident like this? Firefighters. What else? Paramedics, doctors, ambulances, fire department, uh, law enforcement, everything basically. Why? We want to maintain the incident as best as possible and obviously save as many lives, prevent any unneeded deaths, and secure the area. Because we don't know whether this incident was as a result of a mechanical failure, and we don't know if this incident is a result of an act of terror domestic terrorism, international terrorism, whatever it is. We don't know what the reason is. At the moment, we know that we have an explosion. And we know there are cars on fire, and we know that it's in a big mall area, where densely populated area. So we need to respond to this incident. So, as we said, law enforcement, fire, EMS, medical services, we need to notify the hospital. Right? Imagine, imagine Dispatch center, dispatching 50 ambulances, 100 ambulances, police cars, fire department, everything is good. They're starting to respond to the incident, and they take the casualties, the victims, and they start rushing to the hospital. Suddenly, ambulances start pouring into the hospital. What will happen to the hospital? Kids. 
So it's good to notify the hospital. The dispatch center is part of its protocol of activation of mass casualty incident. Must have in the protocol notification as early as possible to the hospitals, enabling them to prepare themselves. And every hospital has to have an incident command system, has to have a coup program put together there, in order for them that when they get the call from the emergency services saying there has been a bomb, we don't know. If there is one injured or if there are 500 injured, we don't know. We know that it's in a shopping mall. The hospital has their own program put together to start activating themselves, pulling in extra doctors, emptying out their emergency room, sending people to wards, whatever it is. They need to prepare themselves in order to be able to um, um, intake this uh, uh, sudden influx of, of, of casualties coming in. Another important thing on the hospital level would be very any operations that are supposed to be performed, stop immediately, postpone them in order to keep the operating theaters available. Because we said in my last presentation that the definitive care for patients, whether it's blast injuries, penetrating, head injuries, bleeding, whatever it is, they need the operating theater. At the end of the day, that's what's going to save their life there and prevent the, the future damage. So those are things that the hospital has to take into consideration. Four minutes into the incident, um, we're looking into the reports that are coming in. We still don't have numbers. We know that there's a lot of smoke. Media immediately starts shooting out pictures already. On TV today, everything within minutes is already in air. There's a helicopter with a camera up there that happened to be in the area. is already uh, showing pictures. The dispatch center has a television as well. Very important. Um, lessons learned. Personal. Back in the day, in 2000, I was, a, a dispatch, a, I was in charge of the dispatch center for the regional ambulance service in, a, in a Jerusalem, and there were bombs going off all the time. Part of the protocol was as soon as there's a mass casualty incident, and as soon as there's a call in for a bomb, part of the protocol besides sending the ambulances out is turn on the television, because you get visual. Sometimes, whatever they report over the radio, as valuable as it is, is not as valuable as what you can see from the reporter's TV camera. It gives you a real picture of what's going on in the field. So Dove, I'll just yeah. chime in here really quick. Sure. Quick review from yesterday. Um, if this hospital were to activate its uh, emergency, uh, I'm sorry, the incident command system, what are the four major sections of any ICS framework? What are those four major modules that we discussed? Okay, so number one is logistics. What, what does that involve? What does logistics involve? Okay, so, so communications, um, uh, supplies, medical supplies, equipment. So that's the first. What are the other three? Operations. What does that involve? Operations involve? Just so shout that, it out the actual tactical response to the incident. So we have logistics, we have operations. What are the other two? Planning. Planning. What does planning involve? In, in an emergency response such as this, what would, our, what would planning folks be doing? Assessment, situational awareness, uh, maintaining documentation. And what was the fourth? So we have Planning, operations, logistics, what was that fourth section of ICS? Finance and administration, what are they doing? They're tracking expenditures, resources, hours worked, finances. Each section is led by whom? What was that title called? These are the commanders at the top. Who leads each section? Section chief, correct. What are the three important positions in the command staff that report right to the incident commander that we talked about. Public information officer, what are they doing? What's the public information officer's role? Dissemination of a vetted, appro approved message to the media. Safety officer, what are they doing? What's their role? Assessing the safety risks sure that everyone involved in the response has proper uh, protective equipment. And what was the third? So we have the safety officer, the public information officer. Who's the third? Liaison officer. What are they doing? Coordinating, uh, 
coordinating, cooperating with all partners, outside agencies, etc. Okay? Go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, we were talking about a safety officer. Why is that so important? Because shortly after the arrival of the first team's site, there's an initial officer that reports that a second blast uh, occurred in front of the dining area, uh, this creating an estimated 50 casualties. Let's remember who's on scene now. It's not only the population that were right next door to the bomb, which are frantic and they're running away or congesting the area to their spectators. They're curious. They want to see what's happening in there. Everybody's gathering in and the others are running away because they're just afraid. And a secondary device goes off. At this point, we already have our people on the ground already. Our, whether it's law enforcement, medical personnel, whoever's on the ground there is now, might be themselves injured. This is very, very important. Always keep in mind there can be a secondary device. It's, it's happened many times. So we're looking at the uh, at aerial view of the food court area. This area is um, what you see all those little dots are the casualties that, uh, that uh, were hit from the secondary device. And what would you respond now? What now? What next? No answer. OK, we're not doing anything. <laughs> next, first of all, we got to understand. We had one bomb in the parking lot. That causes chaos. We have some cars burning there, but no visual of casualties. So people can be uh, um, curious, come and see what's going on, and then the secondary device blows up, and there are 50 people lying on the ground, screaming, bleeding, damage. At this point, chaos kicks in big time. Now, we got to understand, and Eric spoke about this yesterday, you can't actually control the chaos, but you can actually, working with the right plan, you can make sense working through it. So you have to have the crowd control, and you have to have the security, you have to have the bomb squad looking through the site. Is there a third device? Is there whatever it is? You've got to be aware. It happened once, it happened twice. There's no reason why it shouldn't happen a third time. And so we have a chaotic area. People are now running. They saw one bomb, and when the second one hit, and there are 50 people lying there, now at this point, they're not curious anymore. They just want to get the hell out of there. That's it. They're not waiting for the third one. But the ones who are still on site are the emergency forces, the medical forces, the law enforcement. They need to control this crowd, first of all, to make sure they get out of there safely, correct? They need to make sure that there aren't any other bombs there. And, of course, they go to farther perimeters, gathering around there, etc. So what do we need to do? At this point, at every stage during the game, you need to stop a second and reassess, make an assessment of your situation, see what on, what's the information that you have? Coordinate between the different forces. Um, you had a liaison officer, that his job is to liaison between these different agencies, forces, whatever it is, in order to create a picture. Create a picture that will enable us to respond. So strategically and tactically, how do, we, how do we approach this? What are the priorities here? When you're trying to create this picture, so you're, the, the, the main goal is to prioritize, to know what comes first. What do we do first? First, we've got to treat the victims. But at the same time, we've got to make sure the bomb doesn't go off. We've got to make sure that the crowd's running away. Maybe the terrorist himself is running away. You've got to close barricades and streets around for security. See, maybe you can catch the person. Maybe if it's a suicide bomber, that's the report that we had. Maybe it's a suicide bomber. Maybe the guy who drove him there, you need to catch him. So there are all kinds of different elements that affect the treatment of a mass casualty incident. Um, into the second uh, row around, then what happens in the second uh, circle, how will this affect the community? Obviously, the primary objective of terrorism is to implement terror, to scare the people, disrupt the daily activities, and, and cause chaos. So we got to think about how will this affect the community. We got to think what, we, what actions, what plans do we make in advance in order to help the community. There's social workers, there are social services, there's all kinds of different agencies that need to kick in and have their own group. What I'm saying here basically is every, like I said yesterday, every organization, every office, every place should have their own plan of action.
reaction, their own coup, in order to know what they do when something like this happens. Now, tactically, we got to see who's in command and what his responsibilities are. He needs to know, the person in command needs to know, he has, you spoke about the span of control, right, Eric? Spoke about span of control, so you have the people in charge, they report to the incident commander. And what was the idea of span of control in ICS? Three to seven, five being the ideal amount? Correct. Right. It's hard to, it's, you can't control 500 people. It's not going to happen. So that's why you have to have a good structure put together, enabling you, once again, not to control the chaos, but to make sense within it and get the job done. Um, we obviously need more units here on the, on the ground. If we had a little explosion in a parking lot, that's one thing. Now we have 50 casualties at least out front, in front of the food court there, lying, bleeding, dying, whatever. We have more threats of additional bombs, secondary devices, third devices. We have people getting away. What kind of units do we need to see here? Oh, this is not very interactive. <laughs> food just really put you guys to sleep. But and I'll, give you, I'll give you credit. You don't have microphones, so you're shy. But that's okay. Uh, you don't, you're not Israeli. Israelis like to yell. So, uh, so, so I'll, I'll manage. We'll, we'll take it this way. Um, we need to send additional units, additional forces. We got to remember at the same time, while we're treating the incident, we got to keep in the back of our mind the whole time. The big city here, here in Bangalore, it's 11 million people, correct? Something like that. Besides this incident, you have other people to treat. The hospitals need to keep treating other victims. Ambulances need to keep treating other patients. So you've got to have a system that enables you to give whatever you can in order to um, solve this problem that we have now and, uh, and, solve, uh, and treat the regular work. So what are the immediate considerations? Tactically, what do we need immediately? As the incident starts, I just told you this, so you can't say you don't remember. Correct, the hospital prepares, we have incident commander, we have control, we have an incident command system, we have people who know immediately what their job is, and the medics are treating the patients, the doctors and the medics are treating the patients, evacuating them, taking them out, we don't want them sitting on the floor there. Mass casual incident, you don't stay and play, you scoop and run. You get them out of there, There's a, you, you board them, you call them, and they're out of, them, out of there towards the hospital for, for many reasons. First of all, there's a large number of, of casualties. They all, a well, good part of them need definitive care in an operating theater. There's nothing to play around with them on the ground. We want to get them out of harm's way. If there's another device in there, if there's another bomb going to go off, we don't want anybody in that area. So as fast as possible, get those victims out at the same, at the same time. Uh, we have the other activities of the fire department, of the police, forensics. Everybody has their mission. Everybody starts. Uh, uh, their role. What's with our status of our security situation at this time? Do we look at the same? Obviously, if something already occurred, a bomb went off, two bombs went off, it's time to switch on the red light and say, wave a red flag, okay, okay, we're rising our security um, uh, level at the moment. Even if there won't be anything else, it's in order to prevent if there are more attacks on the plan. Um, obviously, you learn intelligence and the value of intelligence in prevention of, of terror attacks. But at the end of the day, once that bomber went off, it means that the intelligence on him specifically fell through. It didn't work out. He made it through. But, but the work of the intelligence now will assist to help his partners the people who assisted him, other, uh, other terrorists that might be on the way for a coordinated attack. We all remember the attacks in Mumbai, a well-coordinated attack in many sites. So if it happens in one place, it could be happening very soon in another place. We've got to put high alert and activate our system. As we go along, more reports. Obviously now people are looking very, open their eyes wide, trying to pay attention, be very alert see what's going on, what's happening, is there bombs, anything happening. There's usually a big escalation after any incident. There's an escalation 
Communication of call-ins to the medical services, to the security services, basically all the emergency services are bombarded with many calls of false alarms, if you may, because when something happens, everybody wakes up. It's all over the media. Something like this is not something that's kept quiet. Every TV channel will be broadcasting from there. The public is scared. At this point, the public feel very vulnerable. Our community was struck. Maybe it's not safe to leave the house. Now I'm very aware this person looks suspicious. Look at that package. Call the police. Very, very important. But the police has to respond to these calls to rule out the option this might actually be a live one. So there's another call that comes in uh, telling us that there's a suspicious device located near the front of the facility. Um, how do you respond to that? What's the effect on our incident? We now have someone call, call, call in and say, somebody comes up to incident commander, says, incident commander, there's a suspicious bag over there. It might be a third device. What happens now? First of all, you try as best as possible to evacuate the scene. Get people as back as far as possible. Activate the bomb squad, special forces, whoever it is, whatever it is, just to make sure to see, uh, uh, to see what happens what happens next. What other actions occur? Like I keep saying, the whole system is working parallel now. It's not a timeline that one thing ha happens after another. Like Eric was talking to you about, everything happens simultaneously. Every person knows what his job is. The janitor at the hospital said something like that, a janitor at the hospital, in an incident like this, his job might not be to be a janitor. He knows that in time of an incident like this, he runs next to the emergency and pulls out beds, next to the emergency room and pulls out beds from the, from the, uh, um, from the storage to have beds out ready for the ambulances to come. Everyone has a role. Got to make sure that simultaneously all these things are happening. And that's the, the role of incident commander. Okay, what is the role of public health in this event? Who's from public health here? Who's from uh, the, the medical world? What's the role here? Public health, first of all, needs to make sure, maintain, that public health is maintained, meaning the hospitals, the clinics. Um, in many incidents, hospitals try to clear out uh, as many people as possible from the hospital to local clinics and other places that can get the care for their situation which isn't emergency in order to mobilize the, uh, the, the hospitals. Another thing is uh, sometimes a hospital receives victims that are critically injured with severe, um, severe uh, medical conditions that that specific hospital can't deal with. So you've got to transfer that, those victims to a higher level trauma hospital that has the capabilities to treat the, the, uh, the incident. During an incident like this, obviously the instinct is to transport the patients to the nearest hospital. It's not necessarily always the right thing. Sometimes if the patient is not severely injured, transport him to a more distant hospital to take the pressure and overload off of this hospital. So they check out this uh, uh, suspicious bag and what do you know? What's in there? Another explosive device. Cellular phone activated, very simple. Here already the news is all over. It has, has coverage of this whole incident, interrupting their morning shows. And uh, you know, just a minute ago, there was an explosion in the mall parking garage followed by, by what appeared to be an apparent attack by a suicide bomber. We have reports of many people injured and that the parking garage has collapsed. Who should interact with the media? I take you back to Eric yesterday. Public information, correct. There's a person. Do we expect every officer on the street there trying to secure the area or assist with the EMS, taking away the patients? Do we expect him? Obviously, the reporters will come up to whoever they can to try to get answers, get an item for the story. First people on the items, that's how TV works. That's how the media works. There's a person who's in charge of that. Everyone has their own job. So obviously... The nature of these incidents is the dispatching center of emergency services is overwhelmed 
by hundreds of people calling in, some of them calling in about the incident, some calling in about, um, about suspicious bags, some of them are calling in about the regular medical emergencies or any other police work that needs to be done. Um, hospitals as well are overwhelmed with phone calls. What kind of phone calls are the hospitals getting? For information for the public. That's a very good, that's right, very good. In many places, they immediately open up in, in their plan of action. When there's something that strikes, immediately, I know from, in Israel, it's very common, unfortunately, very experienced. Um, what happens is when there's an incident, and it doesn't matter if it's a terror attack or if it's a bus that turned over or a big car accident or any other disaster, then immediately open up emergency lines to all the hospitals. Now these hospitals are all connected with each other. They have a specific number to call. And what happens is when there's an explosion, many times the bomb squad will knock down cellular service in the area. Okay? Why? Between the? Exactly. We saw the bag. Cellular phone in there. It's activated by cellular phones. So the instant, in many countries, bomb squad comes to the scene and kills all cellular activity. And what happens? You know that your daughter left 15 minutes ago to the mall with her friends to go and have a, 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 a ice cream, and this bomb goes off. They're watching the morning show, and suddenly they see the mall is blown up. What do they do immediately? They try and call. Try and call your daughter. So you have thousands of people who can't get in touch with their family members, friends, whatever it is, due to collapse of cellular system in the, in the area. So you have thousands of people frantic looking for their loved ones now. So what do they do? If they can't answer the phone, if the person doesn't answer the phone, what's next? They start calling the hospitals. They start calling the hospitals. Can you imagine thousands of people Calling hospitals, is, uh, giving names, giving this. What, you think the hospital has information? Very, very difficult. So also hospitals have to have a plan put together of patients that come in, keep records of everything, and these centers. Um, to these centers to, to provide information to the public, but can this be done through the regular dispatch of the hospital? Obviously not. They have to coordinate the regular operations. They have to coordinate transporting patients to a local clinics. They have to coordinate transporting patients from one hospital to another. They have to uh, cancel uh, surgeries. They have to do many things. So if they have in place a right plan, plan of action, to open up like a dispatch center with a special number, keeping records of everyone that comes into the hospital, the public will be through the media immediately on all television channels you have on the bottom of the screen, Phone numbers, emergency phone numbers for the hospitals. So that if you're looking for your loved ones, you get the information there. The information that they hold there is, is names if they have. If they don't have names, then they have um, like information on what the patients were brought in wearing and, and so on and so forth. So we see these wonderful bombs that were uh, created for this uh, incident. What do we do with crowd control? The crowd is growing as people gather at access points to match, many, br many bringing their own first aid kits, and some with items to assist rescue personnel, food, refreshments, whatever. At the beginning of an incident, the first instinct sometimes is to respond. You have the second bomb, everybody runs away. But then again, many people see that it takes time sometimes for the ambulances to come in. You know, if the incident is in a well-congested area, it will take more time for the emergency services to respond and get to the scene. I have just had a small taste of your traffic uh, at rush hour here. And I can't imagine if, God forbid, something happens, an ambulance needs to get through, let the less, you need 50 ambulances to get through and clear the roads. The police have a big job clearing the roads, obviously. So you have good people. Like I said, I was overwhelmed by the kindness of the people here. So I have no doubt that if someone is in need, people will lend a hand to help. They'll be bringing their own first aid kit from their car. 
they'll bring a, 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 from the store that sells towels, they'll bring towels to put on a, like a bandages for the patients. So you have a lot of crowd accumulating in the, uh, in the disaster area. Okay? What do you do with this crowd? What, how, do, how do you control it? Is this a problem? Is this normal? Um, what, what do we expect this, cow, this crowd to do? Um, do we push them away? Do we respect them? Well, what, what, what are we doing there? What, 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 what would be your thoughts on that? I don't have an answer for that, by the way. Tell me what you would do. Use the? Use them as volunteers. If we don't have enough manpower yet on the scene, mobilize them. You have incident commander with under him. A, a, each person was hit with his responsibility, yes. If you have people willing to help and you don't have yet enough medical response or whatever it is, use these volunteers. I, by the way, think of my experience of years of treating patients. Back in the day when I used to drive an ambulance 20 years ago, 15 years ago, so I would get to a scene of an accident and there will always be one person nagging and bothering and, and just getting in your way. So I found that the best way to control this, give him a job, give him something to do. You take the IV bag, hold that. Don't move. And he'll be standing there for the next 15 minutes. He, you have quiet. You can work. So take the noisiest people, activate them. Give them a job. If you see the crowds are pushing in and you have enough medical response there and there aren't enough police and you need to control the crowd, take the noisiest people and have them push the people back. Make them, give, give them positions. Give them responsibilities. A person is there. He wants to do something. He, he doesn't know what to do. He, he's stressed out. This crazy thing just exploded in his face. He survived. He wants to help. He's nagging you. He's bothering you. Use him to control the crowd. Just little things. Mobilize them. Next, what else? Is this, is, is this crowd a problem? Is this normal, first of all? Probably normal. People are curious, but there's danger here. We want to get them away. We want to get them away as fast as possible. So, in summary, and then I will take questions if you have, because I'm sure you will have some. Um, the story here is the first thing happened is the vehicle exploded inside the parking lot of the shopping mall right next to the hospital, right? Did we know that something like this could happen? We thought it might happen. Remember the phone call? There had been a threat up in the air. By the way, at the end of the day, this could be related, it could be not related, we don't know. But we did have a threat in the air. That's why it's very important to address these threats and rule them out, at least, to see that it's just a cuckoo woman, that she's not really gonna do anything, but she's threatening, or it can be a real, a real threat. Um, we know that a secondary device, a secondary de detonation happened. By the way, what is the ultimate goal of the second uh, detonation when terrorists place a number of bombs or suicide bombers why do they do it one after another in the same area and not at the same time usually to get the crowd to get the panic to get more panic in the system exactly to target the first responders they want to cause damage and panic when you have an incident, an emergency, and the ambulance comes, your heart is already, okay, we're already, they're treating us. But what happens, think about the psychological effect of the ambulance services, the policemen, the fire brigade, everybody coming to the scene, and then they blow up. What kind of effect is that? That overwhelms the system. It overwhelms the system. And uh, personally, years ago when I was dispatching, in 2001, 2000, 2001, I was dispatching in uh, the regional uh, uh, ambulance center in uh, Jerusalem. Um, I hope you don't mind bringing my own personal uh, experiences. I think it's just something that you can take with you afterwards. So I'm sitting there at 11.30 at night, and suddenly uh, we get calls of a bomb that went off on the pedestrian mall in the center of town. We activate our protocol. Unfortunately, we're well experienced, switch on the TV, send the ambulances, you have 50 ambulances on the way, whatever. The incident is rolling, there's chaos, it's happening, we're used to it, but it's happening and we're doing it. And I'm watching the TV, 20 minutes, 20 minutes into the incident, 20 minutes into the incident, I watch the TV, 
I got my radios and everything here, you know, sitting there talking. Suddenly I see on TV a huge explosion. A huge explosion. And I'm like, oh my God. There was just another third device. It went off and our teams are all out there. Inevitably, and this is as experienced as I was and as Superman as I am, this overwhelms you because immediately your instinct is, oh my God, that's us. That's our people. That's our people. Because the key to success in treatment is when you shut yourself out and in general it has nothing to do with you. So it's easier to treat. But when it's someone that's related to you, someone that you know, it affects you emotionally on the treatment. So luckily, we really got lucky. It was a, a third bomb that went off. It was a car bomb. It went off. Luckily, very few people, 10 or 15 people, were slightly injured. The explosion, the velocity went up instead of to the sides. And it was a big miracle. But it did manage to startle the response of the, of, of the incident as far as me as a dispatcher and the people on scene. The fear that it struck them is, 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 is overwhelming. So you always need to prepare yourself for these things and take them into consideration. So the media is quickly broadcasting stories on the incident. We do want the media through the, uh, the uh, uh, through COOP that we have with the incident command, we have someone who's reporting to the media. We want to utilize the media for us. They're there anyway, so they can either bother us just like that person that was yelling, the media are even worse. Let's use them for us. Utilize them. Send out notices saying, don't come to the neighborhood. Stay away from the neighborhood. There is risk of another terror attack. There are another bomb. Whatever it is, use the media for your service. They will be glad to do anything that you want because you're giving them new stories. What do they do in incidents? They keep showing the same picture and asking another person, what did you see and what did you see and what did you see and what did you see? They're, they're looking. They, they got to keep the cameras going. They're on air. Use them. Send out information that you want. Send out, if you're looking for suspicion, if you already have some sort of a, um, profile of the person, suspicious person, then the police utilize the, the, the media to immediately send out the pictures. If, if you're using the, um, if the media can help you, assist you, you suddenly, the hospitals are calling in and saying, we're short on blood. On blood, uh, um, what's it called? You know, um, you know, blood donations? Yeah. For, for blood. In an incident like this, you have many casualties. The odds are they will need blood in the operating theater. So use the media. Go out calling the public. Instead of coming to the scene, go and donate blood. There is do blood donations now that you can do in X, Y, and Z. Utilize the media for yourself. Make the best of it. Try to keep the crowd controlling that way. Um, at the end, the uh, event generated um, from what we did here, it's not 450, we we're talking about more like 50, 60, 70 people. Um, there's always, when we're referring to mass casualty incident, we refer to the waves of the, of the victims. There's the first wave of victims, which you see on site, are the people that are laying on the floor, injured or injured sitting, not getting around. Um, that's the crucial wave of the critically injured. The second wave is those who ran away but suffered blast injuries, like the doctor mentioned before, about blast injuries from distant areas that weren't killed on the spot, but were affected by the blast injury and, or, and ran two blocks away and possibly collapsed there. And there's this third circle, which is the, this wave of victims comes to the hospitals usually, about an hour and a half, two hours after the incident, even three hours after the incident, and this could be an amount of people that is even double the amount of people that were there in the first wave. These are people with ringing in their ears from the blast, headaches, whatever it is. So when the hospital finishes to receive the first wave of victims that came in, the first and second wave, which is relatively 20 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, you're done with all the victims on the scene, they need to prepare themselves for the next wave that will be coming in. Obviously, they're not critically injured, obviously, they, but they do need to be treated. So the hospital can get organized maybe to open up a special clinic for those, to designate an area in the hospital because they know it's going to happen. It happens every time. Every time. Designate in your plan a room to get these, uh, these patients uh, checked out in this room. Um, I think that more or less summarizes it, what I wanted to, to 
mainly emphasize here is actually take what Eric taught you yesterday about incident command. You now understand when we're trying to put it into context of an incident, you see the importance of every single element that he was talking about, how important it is, and how much we have to learn. And by the way, this is just our experience. I imagine that if we really sat with you one-on-one -on -one and learned from you, we could together develop even better systems for this unique opportunity. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, yep, no problem. For all the help. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been an amazing crowd. Thank you very much.